afternoon it is monday the 25th of may 2020 just after one o'clock welcome to uk column news your host today mike robinson myself brian derish and we're delighted to be joined by david scott and of course david bringing us northern exposure from north of the border uh, well here we are locked down still house arrest living clearly not in a dictatorship or uh are we it's hard to say. Um, now, uh, we're going to start off by talking about Dominic, Dominic Cummings, I suppose. Uh, and uh, well, David, uh, let's bring you straight onto the programme uh, with this image, which has been doing the rounds of Twitter. Uh, I think that sums it up. That certainly for the moment. Uh, many thanks to Darren of Plymouth, the, the Twitter account that I got this from. Um, and uh, he was pointing out that uh, that the the toxic effects of the press are being resisted uh, by Dominic Cummings and that there's many good things to be said about that I don't think Mr Cummings is out of the woods yet and I see he's having to make a statement this afternoon so we will see what we will see but uh, in the long continuing saga of keeping the unkeepable rules um, Mr Cummings is the latest to come under uh, political pressure for failing to do so uh, absolutely so let's look at uh, the toxic press Brian uh, yeah well there's quite a lot of it um, we've got here the Guardian um, of course saying Boris Johnson faces renewed Tory pressure to sack Dominic Cummings but it isn't just Tory pressure because it goes on and on this was just some of the uh, tweets that I looked at so we've got Nicholas Sturgeon here Simon Hall MP Damien Collins on and on it goes um, but a few minutes ago just before we came on live uh, this hit the screen uh, the Guardian UK coronavirus live Durham police asked to investigate Dominic Cummings movements and so the um, police commissioner is actually asking the chief constable to investigate uh, Dominic Cummings for his trip up to his parents place in Dur Durham uh, but of course he did actually go and visit elsewhere uh, this was earlier in the year um, but um, bring you to this article which is from the Northern Echo and it's pointing out that uh, GlaxoSmithKline has got its headquarters in Bernard Castle we're up in the Durham Middlesbrough sort of area and um, what's the significance of this well this is just the place that uh, Mr Cummings happened to go to we're not saying he went to Glaxo because this is not known um, but it's rather strange that he went to this particular location unless he was breaking lockdown in order to go to one of the National Trust properties at Bernard Castle well indeed Bernard Castle itself um, we need to remember that Dominic Cummings uh, has been participating in the secret sage meetings this was uh, an old telegraph article before we knew who sat on the sage board um, but apparently the government doesn't want to say why Dominic Cummings was at Bernard Castle now was he there because there was a deal done between Glaxo, SmithKline and Sanofi um, because they're going to work in in uh, do some work in the COVID-19 vaccine field so was he there to help that along or did he just break the rules to go to the castle with his family we don't know but it's worth asking and we just like to point out that Craig Murray who's under a lot of pressure at the moment also thinks there's a lot of questions to be asked about why uh, Mr Cummings was uh, that far north so David I don't know whether you'd just like to comment on that very briefly but uh, who is this spin doctor what does he actually do in government I think he's very important because my personal opinion is that he's helping the government repurpose itself and they don't want to lose him but maybe he's just a magician well this is the thing we don't know we don't actually know too much about him we don't know really what his role in government is we've no idea how much influence he has or hasn't um, it's maybe a bit unwise for Nicola Sturgeon to be uh, picking a fight with him and calling for his resignation publicly like that because if he doesn't go I don't know maybe he's the vindictive type we don't know and this is the thing about our, our government now more and more we know nothing uh, absolutely uh, now let's uh, move on to uh, project oasis uh, and this is uh, publictechnology.net uh, talking about uh, project oasis nhs collates data from symptom tracker apps now we've he heard a lot about contact tracing and so on 
Uh, but uh, we haven't really heard too much in the mainstream press about uh, symptom trackers. Um, so any project Oasis uh, says that it uh, will only work with apps, quote, that have been assessed in the NHS digital health technology standard or against the digital assessment questionnaire. So this is all about symptom tracking. Um, so at the time, at, right at this moment, uh, NHS X and J Hub are working together with the, with uh, the following providers. So let's just have a look at the main uh, providers here. We've got uh, uh, Agitate Link C19, Connected Cognition, Corona Help UK, Evergreen Life, Let's Beat COVID nineteen, Track Together, Your MD, and Zoe. Um, and uh, so the OSS project collects data from all these third party app providers uh, and that helps the NHS respond to the COVID-19 pandemic apparently. Uh, and as I say, this project has been established between NHS X and J-Hub. We'll come on to J-Hub in a second. Uh, during these, uh, this pandemic, third party data collectors, these group on screen at the moment, uh, have been collecting data through apps and websites. Uh, and these apps encourage people to submit symptoms uh, and basic demographic data. Um, so all this data, this basic demographic data, heads off to J-Hub. Um, this is advantage through innovation, apparently. It's really exciting. We'll come on to that in a second. Um, and J-Hub then basically sanitizes or cleans up that data to make sure that there's no uh, personally identifiable information being passed on to NHS X. So it, NHS X gets a green arrow because it's clean and it's fine. Uh, and that allows NHS X to claim that Project Oasis is absolutely compliant with the Data Protection Act. You don't have to worry about it in any way, shape or form. So J-Hub right at the centre of this. Uh, well, what is J-Hub? Let's uh, just have a look at uh, their little video here. Um, and uh, they are, well, it's the Ministry of Defence. Oh, well, we should be reassured. It Mike. is the Innovation Unit for Joint Forces Command. So that's what that is. Uh, their six focus areas are artificial intelligence, autonomy, data analytics, simulation, behavioral sciences, uh, and blockchain. Uh, and they fund and accelerate uh, pilot projects that they uh, sponsor. Uh, and they say that if there's a good balance between user need, technolog technological feasibility and balance visibility, then their target time to pilot is 30 working days. So this is fantastic stuff. But there's a fairly big question here. The data coming from these organizations that are collecting symptoms data is going to the Ministry of Defense for processing. So let's just put this back on screen again. Goes to J-Hub, Ministry of Defense for processing and once the personally identifiable. So there, isn't an, there is an acknowledgement that there is personally identifiable well, information in amongst be. this data. Uh, once that's been removed, it goes to NHSX, then NHSX can claim data protection is perfectly in hand, no problem there. But my question is, where is the unsanitized data going? Is it going to GCHQ? Is it going to MI5, MI6? 77 Brigade. Is it going to 77 Brigade? We don't know. The point here is J-Hub, Ministry of Defence right at the centre of this. So what we're seeing here is the fusion doctrine in action once again. Now we've been using this term fusion doctrine quite a lot over the last months and years. And it's really important that people understand what this represents and what it means. So let's have a quick definition of this. The fusion doctrine, this came from the National Security Capability Review in 2018. Uh, building a culture of common purpose across departments requires, requires improved accountability to shift incentives and behaviours towards a more genuinely whole of government approach. As David Ellis said on, on uh, Wednesday's programme last week, what this means is military, civilian, police, security services, government departments, NHS, charities, all working together on a common purpose, Brian. And the common purpose is suppression of the ordinary man and woman in the streets. We are the enemy now of which this huge surveillance organization. And Mike, I got to say the culture of common purpose, those words common purpose are there because this is common purpose doctrine. This is bringing everything together. And it's certainly 
intending to shift incentives and behaviors because that's what the common purpose of acting beyond authority was about uh, absolutely but of course what we're talking about here with COVID-19 is a complete restructuring in how we are governed and this is the model that's being used everything brought together so let's bring Alex Younger on screen of course uh, uh, Chief Secret Intelligence Service uh, he's the chief of the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. Uh, in the UK, we call this fusion doctrine and involves drawing together all our national capabilities. So this is the OASIS project, Brian and David. This represents uh, it's a, 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 an expression of fusion doctrine. But I was asking myself, what if we're talking about Ministry of Defence here, what is OASIS? So I had a look uh, at the government's definition of OASIS and this was uh, one which I thought was particularly uh, suitable under the circumstances. OASIS it means operational applications of special intelligence systems. And David, that sums it up to me. Uh, this represents another degree of spying on the general public. Yes, and it's part of our hybrid warfare capability. The ability to spy and manipulate and change your own public is being seen as a weapon of war against the various threats that fall below the level of actual conflict. Everything's, everything's now uh, part of warfare. Uh, Russia has been painted as a bad, bad guy conventionally, but if they won't do, someone else will, will be used instead. And everything is weaponized, including your medical information. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the Ministry of Defence handling your personal medical information, that's got to be a classic. There was enough problems with NHS Digital um, allowing material to go to foreign companies with all of the, the tag data, personal tag data still attached. And now we're to be reassured because, well, if we say the Ministry of Defence, I don't think it's going to go to MOD. It's going to go to an organisation like 77 Brigade. That's why they were set up. Um, so, of course, we're not going to get fully out of lockdown, we're told, until there's some kind of uh, vaccine or cure uh, for COVID-19. So uh, let's bring on Professor Adrian Hill. He was speaking to The Telegraph, reported in many other uh, media outlets, but I just thought this quote was so spectacular that, uh, that it needed to be discussed here. Uh, because what did he tell The Telegraph? He said, it's a race against the virus disappearing and against time. We said earlier in the year that there was an 80% chance of developing an effective vaccine uh, by September. Uh, and he went on to say, uh, but in, at the moment, there's a 50% chance we'll get no result at all. We're in the bizarre position of wanting COVID to stay at least for a little while. So he's basically saying that the virus is drifting away, disappearing uh, of its own accord. Effectively, uh, most of our medical uh, advisors believe that we have reached uh, herd immunity already. Therefore, it's disappearing, but it's disappearing too fast for these guys to develop a vaccine from. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to test a vaccine if you've got nobody to test it on yeah. uh, and so on. So uh, this is quite an incredible situation, David, where the medicos are actually demanding COVID to stick around uh, because uh, otherwise they can't v uh, compulsorily vaccinate us all. If it wasn't for the compulsory um, house arrest that we're all under, it would be the funniest thing of the year that he actually said that. He actually said, oh, no, we're not going to be able to develop a vaccine because the virus is going to go away. Oh, dear. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, did he... <laughs> maybe maybe it was he was quote mind. Maybe he's not as... as, as um, lacking an insight is that but uh, it was a very funny piece uh, absolutely and it gets better uh, because this morning uh, Stephen Riker from uh, uh, spy B now if you remember a few a couple of weeks ago we were talking about the uh, this subgroup of sage uh, which is all about behavioral uh, psychology and so on and applied behavioral psychology um, and they had been given advice to the uh, to the government if you remember well he was tweeting this out this morning about Boris's uh, uh, live stream from last night. Uh, as one of those involved in Spy B, the Government Advisory Group on Behavioural Science, I can say that in a few short minutes tonight, Boris Johnson has trashed all the advice we have given on how to build trust and secure coherence to the measures necessary to control COVID-19. Uh, and he said, uh, to, be, uh, to be open and honest, we said trashed. 
Respect the public, we said. Trashed. Ensure equity so everyone is treated the same, we said. Trashed. Be consistent, we said. Trashed. Uh, make clear we're all in it together. Trashed. Well, are these the things that Spivey said? Because I don't think they are. If I remember, remember reading the document, uh, Brian, Spivey said that uh, uh, a substantial number of people still do not feel sufficiently personally threatened. The perceived less level of personal threat needs to be increased amongst those who are complacent using hard-hitting emotional uh, messaging. And he, they were arguing for the media to be used in order to increase levels of personal threat in order to uh, create social disapproval amongst communities uh, to uh, increase the sense of responsibility to others. So I'm not certain that there's too much about being open and honest or respect of the public going on in what they actually published in their document, Brian. Uh, well, I have to agree with that because we, we put out that information exposing that initially. But of course, part of the problem is all of these discussions are carried out in secret behind closed doors. The public has no idea what was and wasn't discussed. And you could say it's possible that maybe somebody did use some of these phrases, but clearly the government hasn't acted acted on it. We're now in a dictatorship. It's a secret state. Decisions are made behind closed doors and we're put under house arrest in UK by, as you would say, David, a government of occupation. These people are getting very, very dangerous. Uh, but we don't need to worry, Brian, because good news, Spivey is going to be publishing uh, a, an e-book uh, initially and then it'll become a, a hard copy book. Uh, Together Apart, The Psychology of COVID-19, uh, so uh, Stephen Riker tweeting out today this morning, we uh, submitted the manuscript of her book uh, on the psychology of COVID-19. It will be available in a few weeks, first as a free ebook, and then as a hard copy. We explain the importance of under uh, underestimating and harnessing group psychology in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, it's and, understanding. We explain the importance of understanding. Sorry, right. It's Yes, indeed. Uh, so, David, uh, group psychology, that's uh, that's another aspect of our future governance. Oh, yes. Yes. Group psychology and fear. And just to uh, come back briefly to the fusion, fusion doctrine, um, this is uh, Sir John Elvidge's Scottish model of government applied to the whole of the UK. We are the testing ground. The Scottish model, model of government, or SMOG, was uh, the removal of departmental boundaries as functional features and uh, joined up government to the ultimate degree. And even Sir John Elvidge now himself is recognizing that this, is, this essentially has drastic unintentional consequences. In Scotland, it, it transformed the third sector from a charitable sector to an extension of the state, to an extension of a, of a spying operation on the people and a psychological operation on the people to, to roll out government policy, which if properly explained would have been hugely unpopular. Uh, it, it essentially, it corrodes and degrades everything it touches. It's a very, very dangerous policy. Mm. Very dangerous, but luckily there are a few people awake. Have a look at this um, UK civil service tweet, which of course has been removed pretty quickly. It says, arrogant and offensive. Can you imagine having to work with these truth twisters? Now, this was put up after Sunday's um, um, government uh, report on COVID. Uh, the Cabinet Office came back and said an unauthorised tweet was posted on a government channel this evening. The post has been removed and we are investigating the matter. And I think the key question is the we. Who is that we? You would say, David, it's a government of occupation and I would agree with you. Uh, who is actually running Britain's government of occupation? Well, that brings us back into the uh, Dominic Cummings and the uh, the rest of the cabal. Mark said, well and said well indeed yeah but uh, where are we going and the subject is bubbles um, now bubbles have been talked about in quite a few articles we've got one here from the guardian a while back uh, it was also discussed on lbc radio many other places here's the daily mail britons could finally see their grandparents family or friends and weddings could be back on under bubble socializing that could start from next month so we're now being told that the next step is abnormality. It's certainly not normality of any kind, and it's going to be done with bubbles. Now, we got interested in what the press was and wasn't saying. I've put up a big block of text here about social and family contacts. 
And what interested me was that uh, although Sage gets a mentioned in this part of the article, um, it's also referring to the New Zealand model of household bubbles. Let's have a look at that. Uh, this could be based on the New Zealand model of household bubbles, where a single bubble is the people you live with. As in New Zealand, the rationale behind keeping household groups small is to limit the number of social contacts people have, and in particular to limit the risk of inter-household transmissions. So it's pretty clear that we're headed into dangerous territory with this. Uh, if we're already under house arrest at the moment, it doesn't appear to be going to get better. So here's the Telegraph, and this is much more recent. This is the 24th of May. Greater social contact to be allowed. Boris Johnson suggests the hinted easing of restrictions could include meetings between more than two households. So my goodness, you've been well behaved, Mike. You're going to be allowed to uh, visit other households. Well, maybe, maybe not. So this is a bit of the detail on it. <coughs> he said less draconian measures which could include, could include more mixing between households in the coming days. And um, it's all part of the government's roadmap for lifting the lockdown. And it raises the possibility of bubbles of social contacts once England moves to step two. Now, you put up that diagram a, uh, a few days ago, Mike. And where are we at the moment? Well, if... Bo Boris made it absolutely clear when he launched his traffic light system, that the uh, DEF DEFCON system, whatever you want to call it, that we were at level four. Uh, and that we were going to be moving towards level three. So it wasn't this one step at a time thing. You move one step yeah. to level three. No, there's multiple steps between each of these levels. So there's no prospect of us moving towards uh, level two, uh, certainly t uh, before the end of the year. Before the end of the year. And at the end of the year, then, we may be allowed to operate in bubbles. So freedom has gone. The UK no longer... A free nation in any shape or form. We can see it in front of our eyes. But where are the bubbles coming from? This is where it gets interesting. So we'd like to introduce you to Mr. Bubbles. And here he is per block. And where does that bring us to Oxford University? Well, who's surprised about that and the Department of Sociology? And this is an extremely bright young man who's into mathematical um, social modeling and he's been doing some very interesting things, as you will see. Let's look at him a bit more closely. Uh, he says it's important to take a common sense approach that factors in the reality of human behaviour. That's encouraging. A 10 person bubble could work just as well as New Zealand's conservative version, but only if those people live otherwise fully isolated lives. So you're going to be allowed to see a few relatives in your bubble, but otherwise you're going to lead a fully isolated life. Adding nine people to your network rather than one or two increases the chances of someone being contaminated at the store or someone breaking the agreement and damaging the bubble's integrity. But we can't develop a vaccine because the virus is disappearing too fast. Well, uh, maybe not, but we're in lockdown, Mike, and whether or not a vaccine comes, this is indicating we're going to stay in lockdown. But what he said in the second paragraph is that Actually, if there's a risk of somebody in your bubble group being contaminated, the bubble numbers are going to get smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And we have a medical expert who's saying if you follow the mathematical modelling to its proper conclusion, you're still not going to be able to see anybody because the greater the number of people in your bubble, the greater the chances that somebody's going to get the virus unless, as you say, it's disappeared. Mm. So what's this young man up to? Well, he's been working hard with other colleagues from other nation, uh, nation states uh, in these sorts of research projects, demographic science, aids in understanding the spread and fertility rates of COVID-19, social network-based distancing strategies to flatten the COVID-19 curve. Now that one is the bubble work, but there's plenty more. Uh, what we don't know at the moment is who's been paying for these studies. So if any of our viewers and listeners can help us with that, who has been paying Oxford University to do these uh, studies. They will not have been cheap. Uh, but uh, who has Per Block been working with? Uh, well, these are some of his colleagues. We've got an Isabel J. Rabe of the uh, University of Zurich, Marion Hoffman from Zurich, and Jennifer Beam Dowd 
also the University of Oxford. And this is part of the social distancing abstract. I know there's a lot of information there. The only bit you really need to pick up from it is it's talking about aiding compliance in a post lockdown world. So this is not about freedom. This is about abnormal practice in keeping people locked up. Um, sorry. Compliance with what in a post-lockdown world? There can only be compliance. Compliance if we're to the not... bubble system. Mike. Ah, right. Compliance to the bubble system. I see. So the new normality is going to be bubbles, which could be very, very small indeed. And if you follow these people through, can we show that they're working with the British government? Well, we can. Here's Isabel Rabb. And she says, who would have thought that one day a piece of my work will be discussed in a briefing by the UK Parliament? And here is uh, post UK Parliament with um, the detail or details of the report, which is proposing the long term use of these bubble groups. And if you look at that report itself, although this is going back to the beginning of May, you can see that they, without any problem at all, were realising that things were going to be abnormal until November at the latest. So your right. comment about the end of the year might fits the bill. And uh, if we have a look at the other lady that uh, Per Block was connected with, this is Marion Hoffman. And she says today, one of my scientific works ended up on the front page of CNN, right next to the picture of Trump. I'm both proud and very amused. So this is about bubbles and social distancing. It's coming out of Oxford University, but apparently we're now conning the Americans again about uh, denying them of liberty on the basis of what takes place in Oxford University. Uh, but to be fair to this lady, she also retweeted this. And what she was pointing out is they'd also been studying the mental health effects of long term lockdown. And in the graphs there, it's clearly showing major effects on people's mm -hmm. mental health. And it referred through to a much bigger study. And I'm sorry, it's not very clear. That was the best graphic I could get. But this is a really big study of the dangers of not only COVID on the on the left in the bluey purple cover of that. That's the deaths. But on the right in the orange at the bottom of your screen, you've got all the adverse effects of lockdown, including depression, anxiety, stress, suicide and a massive increase in child abuse, which we hope to talk about. Uh, this coming Wednesday. So have the British government been taking any notice of these warnings, Mike? I don't think so. Has the press and the BBC been warning about the real effects of lockdown? No. Um, so we've got the bizarre situation while SAGE and the Behavioural Insights team, as you say, have been ramping up the fear of COVID-19. We've got this uh, uh, Oxford University group warning about the dangers to mental health. Mm. David, uh, I find it pretty difficult to, to believe that the government isn't paying attention to this stuff and, and it becomes difficult then to think any different than th this is intentional. It's, it's paying attention to it because very largely it will be funding it. It's putting it into papers, it's discussing it at cabinet meetings, it's most certainly paying attention. Now, here's the question. Nobody, apart from one or two outstanding people, most of them Italian or New Zealanders, nobody's actually standing up in the political world and saying, no, this is nonsense. The, the, the virus is over. We need to be getting back to normal. You are lying to us. You are deceiving us. And that's, that's the message that needs to be put forward. Now, there's no hint of any of that coming forward in the uh, in in the in the rooms in which these decisions have been made um, and therefore we're just getting um, intellectual cover uh, for a decision that's being made for other reasons this is intellectual cover for the elite intellectual cover for a totalitarian state it needs the intellectual cover in order to persuade the people uh, to um, to consent to this. Um, absolutely. Well, if it's not being discussed by politics, uh, politicians, then there at least there is at least one mainstream uh, journalist attempting to 
blow the whistle on this if you if you like this is peter hitchens uh from the uh, mail on sunday uh, we'll never get out of this now that he's talking about the lockdown it will go on forever uh, we will not be free people again he said i hate this word lockdown because it does not seem to me to be fitting to describe free people in a free country uh, but we no longer we are no longer such people or such a country we've become muzzled mouthless voiceless humiliated regimented prisoners that's pretty strong and i think absolutely on the money david absolutely on the money the reason he objects to the word lockdown is it be, is it comes from the united states penitentiary system and this is how you punish inmates if they riot is you keep them in their individual cells uh, for very prolonged periods and that is exactly what is happening here and by by the use of this word uh, that he sees that uh, our nation our people are being seen as inmates and our country has been seen as a prison and that's why he objects to the word but he's been forced to he's been forced to admit that the word is appropriate of course in scotland we're getting a double dose because nicola nicola sturgeon's view is that boris doesn't go far enough so we've got our own word which is jock down um and uh, we're just getting everything that you're getting uh, and a little bit more besides but hitchens is quite right we have become a nation of prisoners the the love of freedom the love of liberty has has been surrendered almost without a word uh, yeah well uh, now last week we were talking about uh, tobias elwood uh, who of course uh, serving with uh, well at least as a reservist with 77 brigade while he's also the uh, chairman of the defense select committee which is supposed to provide oversight on 77 brigades activities not cl quite quite clear how that can be the case but anyway yesterday he was tweeting this out government is entering the most complex phase of biggest emergency since one world war ii but the ship is being blown off course time for a formal address from the captain offering firm leadership command and control resolve setbacks uh, reunite collective resolve and rebuild mission focus what fascinated me here david was he isn't saying that uh, uh that, that the, the the pandemic is entering the most complex phase of the biggest emergency since World War II. No, he said government is entering the most complex phase of the biggest emergency since World War II. I think he's not referring to coronavirus or COVID-19. He's referring to the restructuring of uh, our governance and that this is the critical phase. If people don't get to grips with what's going on with the restructuring of government now, and they leave it a bit longer it's going to be too late because fusion will have already happened mike that's uh, the answer to that uh, absolutely uh david you, you see you, you see the, the difficulty he's got though I mean, that that was strange language um disjointed language you see the difficulty he's got he's talking about mission focus now if you're right and i think you are the mission's secret because the stated mission is protect us all from nasty COVID 19 the wuhan flu is going to get you be afraid the official the official mission is to make everyone safe and get out the other side of this. And the unofficial mission is something else. That's why we're talking about the new normal, because the unofficial mission, the real mission, is to change society. He can't say it. So he realizes they're losing direction. The reason they're, they're losing direction is their direction is secret. Their direction dare not speak its name. This is their problem. Uh, absolutely but perhaps uh, well brian's been talking about bubbles uh, perhaps this gives us a clue as to how so one expression <laughs> of the bubbles uh, this is the san francisco chronicle circles in the grass for san francisco parks get social distancing markings and we've got people sitting in the on the grass in a circle clearly not allowed to leave the circle david just before you comment on this i just want to put uh, this back on screen again because of course this is uh, from vanessa bailey who was tweeting out last week the week before the uh, the images from french schoolyards uh, of the the school kids in their well not circular but square bubbles here um <laughs> where does this end up well it's pathetic um uh, as lionel media said i've really got the the um the, the shot from the uh, san francisco parks um uh, it's also <sighs> It's trying to control us in a way which is which is condescending. I mean, it's 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 treating us all like children. It's treating us all like children in a schoolyard. 
And I just hope that if that is ever tried in this country, um, the people of Britain just say no. Absolutely. Um, I'm sitting here silent because um, it is just outrageous what's happening. But clearly, we're no longer in a free country, that's for sure. Uh, absolutely. Now, if you like what the UK Column does and you would like to support us, then please head over to uh, ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options uh, to help us out there. Uh, and uh, well, on Friday, Brian, we mentioned uh, David Noakes uh, and uh, the fact that he is in prison. Um, and uh, well, we forgot, don't have the slide. On. No, we, we'll put a slide up on uh, Wednesday. But, but, but I'll just read this out. David's uh, prison number is A7081DY. That's Alpha 7081 Delta Yankee. And he, he will be in, uh, in uh, Exeter prison. So yeah, uh, you'll get the address for that online. But, that's all uh, we know. Yes. I'll just add thank you very much to. Um, those of our, our viewers and supporters who've uh, sent us donations, uh, it's very kind. Some of you have been very generous, which is much appreciated, and also some interesting gifts. Uh, yes, absolutely. Now, uh, David, on Friday we were talking about uh, public debt and the economic uh, situation at the moment. Uh, the Guardian here, uh, their headline, a classic, the Bank of England needs to think the unthinkable to rescue the economy. Now, on Friday we were talking about the fact that government has now uh, issued uh, bonds with uh, negative interest rates, uh, a, a negative yield attached. Um, the Bank of England, as we mentioned on Friday, up until the last few days really has been denying that it was going to move into a proper negative interest rate territory, but uh, it's looking increasingly likely. Yes, and I, I thought this was, uh, with the exception of the, uh, the, the professor, um, lamenting the passing of, of the COVID-19 uh, virus before he could get his uh, vaccine tested. The funniest uh, headline of the week, think the unthinkable. The bank will have to think the unthinkable. No, it's Guardian. The bank will have to do the undoable in order to recover from this mess. Um, the, the then follows a discussion about all the advantages of zero interest rates because it will save the banks. It, the Guardian's quite clear. It will save the banks and it will stimulate lots of borrowing for us all, we're going to borrow, we're going to go out, we're going to spend, we're going to buy some Jaguars and we're going to buy some, I don't know, fridge freezers and, and we'll save the economy by borrowing money that doesn't exist um, and spending. And with zero interest rates or negative interest rates, uh, the more you spend, the more you save. So you'll, you'll, you'll take out a loan, not because you need one, but because you can't afford not to. It's mental. It's, it's, it's economic insanity. And then they say, well, there might be a problem here because if you give people negative interest rates, why would they save anything? Yes, Guardian, that's a good question. And of course, people will respond rationally and they will not save anything. And what's the basis of recovering the economy? It's based on saving and investment. So we're going to kill it. We're going to kill saving and investment. And then we're going to wonder why capitalism isn't solving the problem. You can just see it uh, running out again. We're in for a 1930s style depression and uh, the Bank of England are going to lead us there. Um, I, I agree with just about everything you've said there, David. But of course, one of the impacts of social distancing is that shopping becomes an utterly unpleasant experience. Uh, and the fact that you've got a queue for two hours just to get uh, two feet forward in the queue um, is going to prevent people from actually spending money in shops. So what are we going to do with our money? Well, I, I think it's probably good if you're if you're called Amazon. Um, I think there, there are going to be certain certain companies will do quite well. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of delivery vans on the road. But yes, you're quite right. Shopping is uh, a strange form of um, psychological torture these days. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Look, let's uh, let's move on because uh, we've we've uh, only got a few more minutes left. Uh, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. This is Traffic Scotland. Traffic Scotland uh, used to they, they be. Don't seem uh, to have the new, they don't have the new buzzwords, the new the new lines. No, that's that's in England. We're not having any of your fancy English buzzwords in Scotland. This is uh, they actually changed it this morning. But up until this morning, stay home, protect the NHS was still the official line in Scotland. And this is uh, an organisation that used to put out traffic reports and had a large following online because if you wanted to know where the traffic jams were, you could go on and they would tell you, and it was very useful. 
and they're now uh, putting out government propaganda and the the uh, piece of text which was on the screen there is them um, asking people not to debate politics on the site because they're non-partisan and they're not political so they're they're operating as a political mouthpiece and propaganda agency and then complaining when the public answer them with political comments um so they're they're toiling to find a new role in the strange new scotland now on the subject of strange this next one um i want to warn viewers this one's quite creepy let's watch it the children of scotland would like to say thank you to nicola our first minister of scotland we are so grateful thank you for always keeping us safe working so hard for being strong for us Thank you for caring for every individual life and for always thinking about the children of Scotland. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. STV News. Welcome to North Korea. That was STV News put that out. Uh... There are almost no words. It, it was actually painful to watch that again. I was cringing, as you no doubt saw. It, the North Korean link has not gone unnoticed, however. It keeps coming up in the reports on this piece of video. David, that, um, that's, that is child abuse. Those children have been groomed and used for blatant political purposes. That's abuse. Yes, absolutely. It is it is abusing children for political purposes. Yes, for political gain and to praise the dear leader. It is genuinely North Korean. So here you see uh, um, the, the Times reporting STV clip praising Sturgeon as compared to North Korea. Um, and also we've got the Express and Daily Business. It's actually going around the world. It's so bad. It's, it's like a lot of the things the SNP do, does it actually brings international ridicule. Um, so it's, it's Scotland's number one in something these days. Um, and again, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the, the video uh, removed after viewers compared it to dictator Kim Jong-un, or Kim Jong-nip, as she's now being called increasingly north of the border. So um, I, I was just getting over that when I came on the National. Now, the National is like Pravda for Scottish people. It's very, very pro-SMP to an embarrassing degree. And this was what they're calling news. Nicola Sturgeon's 21st uh, birthday message boosts uh, students' uh, spirits. And it goes on to say, Mum Margaret said Nicola's positive words boosted spirits for the family who'd been disappointed to cancel Kirsty's planned celebrations with family and friends. So th this, is, this is the dear leader reaching down to the ordinary people, the humble people like you and me, and enlightening someone's life. This is totalitarianism. This is the dear leader the cult of celebrity applied to politics. This is North Korean. Uh, okay, now let's uh, move swiftly on uh, to sex education. And uh, well, tell you were talking about this last week to some degree. Yes, I just wanted to follow up on that. I, I came across this document. This is the World Health Organization. So it's the same organization that's going to chart our way safely through COVID-19 and that we have to listen to and whose every word is basically um, written on tablets of stone. This lot um, produced 10 years ago, and this had a major impact all around Europe, the, the, the Standards for Sexuality Education in Europe, a framework for policymakers, educational and health authorities and specialists. And particularly, they've got part two um, uh, called the Sexuality Education Matrix, back to uh, the matrix again. And I've got a little extract here, and I, I'll, I'll try and say the words because it's quite difficult. This is for children zero to four. This is for zero to four year olds under sexuality. The main topic is enjoyment and pleasure when touching one's own body, early childhood masturbation, discovery of own body and own genitals, the fact that enjoyment of physical closeness is normal and part of everyone's life, tenderness and physical closeness as an expression of love and affection. Is this not child grooming? Zero to four. This is what the World Health Organization is putting out and, and governments, Scotland, Ireland, England, Germany for sure, all around Europe followed this 
This is why we're having our children corrupted because the world, the World Health Organization says do it, and our politicians say yes, sir. Uh, David, I think I think that is almost equivalent to uh, what was being suggested by Pi Pedophile Information Exchange and Pal uh, Pedophile Action for Liberty, which was, of course, those policies were supported by the Labour Party back in the day and exposed in the national press. So these people haven't gone away. They're just trying to push this policy through by another route all these years later. Um, and uh, then David uh, the Telegraph here reporting that the SNP is considering asking rich Scots people to pay a million each for a university bailout. Yes, we are. We're now casting around uh, desperately to find a solution uh, to the fact that the universities are grossly underfunded and that the various promises made by the SNP over the years can no longer be afforded and the whole system which is an enormous education bubble, is collapsing. Now, none of the mainstream press carried any decent analysis on this, uh, but one of the blogs did. This is Lily of St. Leonard's, also known as Effie Deans. Anyone who knows Twitter might recognise that name. She is, in, in fact, a Scottish academic, and uh, she put a very good blog entitled Universities Need to Learn to Survive COVID. Final paragraph of which I'll read in full because it's excellent. Universities have been running a Ponzi scheme. We get ever more students to pay ever more money for a degree that is ever more useless in order that we that ever more academics and others can be employed. The purpose of university has ceased to be education. It has become maintaining ourselves in the comfort to which we've become accustomed. This model is now bankrupt, and unless we embrace change, we will cease to exist. And that was, I thought, absolutely perfect. There was a clue earlier in the week that something was amiss. Um, Alex Salmond had promised with a tablet of stone that he would never um, put uh, fees on university education. And here he is unveiling the stone. The rocks will melt in the, uh, with the sun before I allow tuition fees to be imposed on Scotland students. That stone had been put in a little garden area at Terry Watt University in Edinburgh, and it's just been removed. And I think that's what we call a clue. Uh, a clue to what? Well, the Telegraph tells us here, uh, SNP urged to impose graduate charge as Scottish universities face COVID-19 funding crisis. So we have problems in all areas, all levels of Scottish education, from the corruption of our children when they're very young to the failure, the utter failure of university system to provide anything that looks like value for money and now uh, to be able to uh, pay for the hugely inflated sector that it, uh, it has become. Yes, right. Well, uh, just uh, a couple of things to end here then. Um, earlier on, David, you said we, you know, people were accepting lockdown uh, very quietly. Not everyone, not everyone. There is, There are glimmers of hope. Uh, and uh, this is perhaps uh, one such. Uh, this is uh, Central Park in Plymouth. And every single path into Central Park carries this graffiti saying Boris kills. Uh, this, of course, referring to the lockdown uh, more than anything else. Uh, so we've got to take some hope from that, Brian. Yeah, the, the people are seeing what's really going on and, and they're trying to speak out in, in the only ways they've got available to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as, as uh, time goes on, uh, companies uh, provide us with uh, the, the, the things that we need in order to campaign. Uh, now, this is Australian company, of course. Uh, thanks to Ian Crane for this, uh, for this photograph. Uh, this is a coffee club in Australia. Uh, and they've got a sign outside their their shop. They're saying, "Show us your app. If you show us, if you show our staff that you have downloaded the COVID Safe app, you can upgrade your coffee for for free." If we start seeing this thing in the UK, David, uh, you know where where corporations are taking it upon themselves to try to police uh, what we do, uh, then really that gives us a perfect campaign. The, the organisations like this need to be boycotted. Oh yes, this this is this is very good because everyone's got a vote. It's called a pound coin, and if you've got that vote, you just vote against totalitarianism in a very direct way. Okay, and we'll end with this excellent meme, which says it all. Really, stay alert. The media is the virus. Keep a safe distance from the BBC, Sky, Channel Four, ITV, and the Guardian. Um, somebody really <laughs> thinking on their feet there. So we're going to say well done. That's it for today. Uh, we can't stress strongly enough how bad the situation is getting in UK. If you want to stop it, you have to speak out. 
tell other people warn other people spread the facts and the information and above all take the lid off the government's repurposing of itself and uk society which is being done without our um, support and without our permission uh, it's going to take many people to do a little bit not a few to do everything thanks for joining us bye bye, -bye.